Um, I want to, before I actually start the teaching, I just want to uh, make a comment with regard to the, the teaching guides before you. You guys can use that however you want to. There are some that want to diligently try to fill it in as we go. And I don't know if you're, but sometimes for me, I feel like I'm miss, missing something going to the next part because I'm still trying to make sure I fill it out. So I have the answer sheets. I've actually, I've taken one and filled it in. The different color, the answers. And as soon as class is over, I already have a draft email and I will send the answers out to everybody, okay? <laughs> so some of you I know will still want to, you know, jot your own notes or whatever, but know that you will get those those answers back. So if you just want to sit back and relax and take it in, it's up to you, okay? I don't want it to be stressful because <laughs> I'm one of those that's trying to fill in every blank. <laughs> What's that? Where are the snacks? <laughs> She's giving us the answer. That's <laughs> yeah, that's your snack, right? <laughs> okay, so welcome to Casting Nets to Courageous Leadership. I am just excited to have all of you here. And I am excited to be here because this has been a one-year journey for me. I actually, back in August of last summer, in my quiet time one morning, I was getting chills. <laughs> my, my, my quiet time one morning, for some reason, Peter the Apostle just was like on my heart. And I thought, hmm. And I, during the day, I kept coming back and thinking about that. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe there would be some, a, a fun teaching to do out of that. So the way I kind of test that is I went on Amazon and I bought about four or five different books, like Bible studies, commentaries, things like that, that were about Peter. And I got those and I just started reading those. And go, oh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm getting all excited. Pretty soon I have this high level eight session thing, you know, that just a very high level out outline. So come January of this year, then I started digging deeper and developed each of the lessons and the materials and stuff. And I've just enjoyed this time so much. So it's really exciting <laughs> for me. And thank you to Debbie to allowing me the opportunity to be able to share with you what the Holy Spirit has shown me through these many months as I, as I have worked on this. You have to excuse me, I, have, I had a cold or something a while back and I still have a little bit of a raspy throat. So pardon me for that. So, introduction and new identity for lesson one um, this week. Let me begin by talking a little bit about um, introduction to Peter in the Gospels as a whole. Okay? We know that Jesus is the lead character, right, in all four Gospels, of course. But Peter is in all four Gospels as well. And he really is kind of like a key supporting character to Jesus. Sometimes he's contrasting, sometimes he's highlighting, and sometimes he's edifying particular characteristics of that lead character. Peter's mentioned more than any other person aside from Jesus in the Gospels. He's also the disciple who is praised the most. Thank you. Bless you. And he's... Um, also, though, the disciple that's also rebuked the most. <laughs> I think that's what we're going to see, these, right, these kind of these two sides of Peter's character as we go through this. By the time the Gospels were written, Peter had already been put to death. And so you can kind of understand that there may have been a tendency on the part of the authors of the Gospels, perhaps to maybe be a little soft on Peter, but the good news is that's not what they did. All of them really show Peter the good parts, the bad parts, warts and all, right? Warts and all, which is good because there's so much more for us to learn from that. So in addition to those shortcomings, we also see on display Peter's courage. And the thing that really stood out to me in this study was his longing and determination to follow Jesus. He didn't always do that perfectly, but what, what a loyalty and a determination that there was there. 
I think that likely, thinking of, the, of how the gospel writers show both sides, I really suspect that Peter, in all his preaching that he did, he did the same thing, that he was just real and showed the good points, the bad points. And, and I think, again, that's such a healthy thing for us, right? Because we, he could really connect and we can connect with him. Peter was indeed a flawed but faithful disciple. And doesn't that represent us all <laughs> who believe in and seek to follow Jesus? We all would like to do better than we do, right? Um, Peter had a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus. And that same relationship, right? Even though we are not there in person, although sometimes you kind of long to, right? That what it would have been like to be there in the first century with him. But we can still have that same sort of intimate relationship with Jesus that he did um, because of that Holy Spirit, right, in us and allowing us to really, really understand. So we are very fortunate in that. Hopefully this whole story of Peter as we continue on studying together, that we will get to know Christ more fully and we will become what we can see is the characteristics that help us to become more the disciples that he calls each one of us to be. Now, a bit of a comment about the Gospel of Mark in particular. As in, their, in your homework, I asked you to take a look and see if you could find what, who the author of that gospel was. And what you probably found was that there's no direct evidence, right, specifically of who that author was. But all of the church fathers, fathers in the early church, right, their unanimous testimony was that it was John Mark, also known as Mark, who was the author of that gospel. John Mark was a very close associate of Peter and when Peter was in his early ministry, especially in the early Roman Christian communities. This is also the John Mark, if you thought about it, that is the son of one of the Marys, right? That is a follower of Jesus as well. So we have a lot to be thankful to Mark for, right? Because <laughs> he, he preserved all of this from hearing those those preachings of, of Jesus or preachings of Peter, right, out there that he captured. Though that's how he learned the things that Jesus had said and done was from Peter's preaching. The other thing that I thought was interesting about John Mark is not only do we have this Bible now that uh, this gospel that's lived through the ages, but back there in the first century, it was the, the gospel was written in Aramaic, but he also translated it into Greek and Latin. So even back then, it was able to have much wider distribution. Let me get a little bit of this water quick. Maybe. <laughs> oh, good, thank you. A little bit of the early background on Peter. His given name at birth was Simon or Simeon, and that is a name of Greek origin. He was originally from the fish, fishing village of Bethsaida, and Bethsaida actually means fisherman's city. It's on the northeast bank of the Jordan River, right about where the Jordan River dumps into the Sea of Galilee. Later, um, still a fairly young man, but he had moved on to Capernaum. He was likely educated at the village synagogue, which was the, the custom at that time for the young males. Apparently not the females. He just kept referencing the males, but we won't go there. <laughs> it is assumed that he was an apprentice um, to his father to learn the trade of being a fisherman. Now, fishermen were really kind of a lower class of people back then. They were usually quite poor, and they um, often were um, seen as people that were not so careful about the strict observance of all of the Mosaic law. So they were kind of um, looked down upon. The other thing that I thought was interesting that, that some of the commentaries said that they, he was looked down upon was um, because at that time, you know, you have the Roman Empire right over that 
whole geographic area. And because that was kind of difficult on their whole environment for them, many of the people could not afford to buy beef or lamb to eat. And so fish was such a staple. Now, you'd think they'd be thankful for those fishermen, but they kind of, I think just that, you know, thinking of that relationship between the fish and this Roman Empire, that it caused them to kind of also look down on that fisherman's trade. There were three common methods of fishing in Peter's time. One is the hook and line, catch a, you know, individual fish at a time. There was also casting the nets from the shoreline. And then the thing that we actually see in some of the gospel stories is what is actually called dragnet fishing. So you have two boats that are working together side by side with men on each holding their side of the net. And as the boats would move forward and kind of spread apart, the net got bigger and wider and they could bring in a huge haul of fish. That was the good news. The bad news then it took a whole lot of brute force <laughs> to haul all of that in. <clears throat> but that was a common way of fishing back then. It would have been customary for Peter to have married in his teens in that, in that day and age. And we do know that he was married. There's two references in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 1 and in 1 Corinthians 9, that mention Peter's wife. So we do know he was married. I want to speak a little bit about the influence of John the Baptist and Peter's brother, who is Andrew, and their, their um, initial um, importance in terms of, of Peter's life and, and how he, he came to know Jesus. Most Jews were very insulted by the teachings of John the Baptist. And that is because John taught that relationship with God was a personal decision not a result of heredity or nationality. So you can think about for the Jews, those chosen people of God in terms of the beginning of our whole, you know, God's redemption plan and, and story that it was unfolding, they, you know, they still feel they were the chosen ones. So that was a bit of a hard pill for them to swallow. But that John was adamant that, that it's a personal decision. That's what makes this different. And so to call his fellow Jews back into a more acceptable relationship with God, he did a very radical and symbolic thing. He invited his fellow Jews to participate in proselyte baptism. Now, I had to do some digging because I wasn't very knowledgeable about that. And when I, once I understood that, boy, that was really a smart strategy. <laughs> Probably from God, of course, but it was a smart one. Proselyte is actually a word that comes from, it's from the Greek that means stranger or newcomer. And so they used um, that term when they would um, actually baptize um, some Gentiles, right? And, and we'll talk about two levels of, of devotion the Gentiles would show. But they would actually do these proselyte baptisms of the Gentiles who wanted to convert to being a Jew, okay? The Gentiles who just kind of, in general, kind of adopted the faith and kind of went along with it, they were called God-fearers. However, if a Gentile became quite devoted and, and, and really wanted to follow this God of Abraham, they really they wanted to become a, a true Jew, then they could do so if they were male, number one, and if they did three other things, if they were circumcised, they would promise to give alms to the temple, and they would do this proselyte baptism. So there was this purification ritual. They would water baptize them, right? And they did those other things. Then they were now considered converts to Jewish, to the Jewish religion. So, Right? So they have this history of this proselyte baptism. Right? So John's now saying, you come, accept that if this is a personal decision, and you will and be baptized, and you are converting from being Jewish to this new faith. 
kind of interesting. I didn't, uh, I didn't know before that, oh, that other history. <clears throat> All the gospel writers um, concur that Jesus agreed with those concepts, that practice of John the Baptist, and how better could he have demonstrated that but to ask John the Baptist to baptize him, right? Now, one other thing that I thought, <clears throat> a cultural thing that was a bit interesting about difference between Jews and now this new Christian faith is that uh, Jewish boys typically uh, chose the rabbi that they wanted to train under. Jesus said something very different, didn't he? He told his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you, right? And we have, a, I, I put, put down a couple of other New Testament passages too um, that, that emphasize that fact that we are chosen. At our table, we actually were talking about this today in our discussion, that we are chosen. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5 clarifies, God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in order, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Chosen before the creation of the world, right? And then I love this, what um, Jesus is recorded as saying in Matthew eleven twenty seven: All things have been committed to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, right? So we have this predestination, right? And then we have this revealing of Jesus, allowing us now that opportunity to make that personal decision, right, for the Christ. And of course, now we have that, that benefit of that Holy Spirit, right, in filling us and allowing us to be able to do that. Coming back again to John the Baptist, and the incident where he is with um, Andrew, Peter's brother, and one other unnamed disciple. Jesus passes by, and John says, look, the Lamb of God. And this is where Andrew says, we talked about this in, the, in our homework. This is where Andrew, I said, kind of awkwardly answers, where are you staying? You first read that, that feels kind of like an odd reply about, you know, what Jesus says, what do you seek? What do you seek? And he says, where are you staying? But you dig a little bit deeper and you think about it. That's really where Christian discipleship begins, isn't it? It's when we develop a hunger and thirst to know where God is, to want to be in his loving presence right? It's really the intent there is about describing relationship, right? Relationship. And when you look at Jesus' reply in this case, that just, I think, substantiates that thing about relationship because Jesus replies to it. He didn't think it's awkward, right? He just says, come and you will see, right? Welcoming them in. And it says they left and spent that day with him, right? They had the beginning of that personal relationship with him. Grabbed a little water. I couldn't leave it at that, though. I was too curious about it. <laughs> so I dug a little bit deeper because I thought there's got to be more to this. Where are you staying? So in my study, I looked at very, a bunch of different trans, tra translations. And they used different words than staying. Some said remain. Some just said stay, hold, and abide. And the intent there, again, is describing relationship, right? I think my preferred rendering there was abide. That kind of said it for me. And I think probably because of the familiarity with you know, John 15 and Jesus talking about his relationship with us and the, the imagery of the, the vine and the branches, right? And him saying, to, talking to them about abide in me. So from the perspective of Jesus in this conversation, you think about him wanting them to, to abide in him. That is both an invitation, right? Come, 
he says, an invitation. And then it's also like a, a command, right, a, to continue. Come and you will see. Stay with me. Remain with me and you will see. From the believer's perspective, to abide or to stay with him is more than just a belief or a feeling. Right? It is actually a verb. Right? It's something that's, that's active. Right? So what it's really saying is abiding in Jesus is choosing. You're making an active choice, choosing relationship with Christ. And then that follows with other action, right? Where you, you choose to heed his word, learn his word, walk in his ways, try to reflect his love, right? It's active. It's active. I couldn't help but um, more appreciate John 8, 31 and 32, where Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are my true disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will will set you free. What hit me here is I couldn't help again as I study Peter to think, oh, that would be so neat to have been back there, right? But we have the same ability, right, to get to know him, and it's because now we abide in his word. How precious is that Bible, that word of God, because that's, right, how we get to know Jesus. Right? That's how we get to know him now. It's not face-to-face -face yet. <laughs> Someday it will be, right? But I, I really like that verb. Mean, that, that, that verse just meant more to me now. To abide in my word, you're my true disciples. Now, the next thing that Andrew did is that he goes and he finds Simon, and he brings Simon back and introduces him to Jesus saying, we found the Messiah. <laughs> that was probably a pretty revolutionary thing to come out of their minds after all these years of waiting, right, for the Messiah to come. And he, so he, he is, the brother introduces him to him. Now, there, I think there's two common truths about introducing people to Jesus. There's lots of them, but two things that really came to my mind as I was studying this. One is that usually, not always, but most of the time, I'd say, that people are introduced to Jesus by somebody that they know. Lots of times, usually somebody they know and trust, right? And the other thing is that remembering when it, what it's like to be in that new relationship when you've just been introduced, if some of us are, are not too old to remember or it didn't happen too young to not know. But you, there's this, this time of, all kinds of questions. Right? There's all kinds of questions and maybe even misconceptions because it's all so new. And I think it's good for us to remember after we've been in the faith for a while and we kind of just take certain kinds of truths for, for granted, we need to still pause and remember that for newcomers that there's a lot of questions, a lot of questions, and we need to be patient and loving and helping to address those. Pause again. Sorry for the interruptions here. I was really taken back this time in studying to realize that the very first words that come out of Jesus' mouth to Peter was, you are Simon, son of John, but you are going to be called Cephas. <laughs> it's like, where did this come from? I just met you. <laughs> and you're giving me a different name. No, you know, I just kind of got a little chuckle out of that, thinking about that. And I have to tell you that, um, to be correct, I have always heard that pronounced Cephas. I don't know if that's what you've typically heard that. Um, strict, just being very correct, in Hebrew, it would be actually pronounced Cephas, as if it were spelled K-A-Y-F-U-S. But I'm old and kind of stuck in my ways, so it's going to just keep coming out as Cephas for me. But let the record show I told you it's Cephas. And that means rock in Hebrew. Okay, It means Peter in English. And then I found this really interesting. It means Petros, Petros in Greek. And Petros is not just rock. 
Petros actually means a rock ledge or cliff. So we're talking about a massive rock foundation. So when he says to him, on you I will build my church, right? Upon you I'll build my church. He's, he's Peter, he, I mean, Jesus is really seeing something strong, right? Massive. He, he, I get chills when I think it's a rock ledge or cliff. He was changing. He saw this potential. And he was changing Simon's very identity right from the get-go. I'm giving you a new name. Pretty soon you're going to have a really new life. <laughs> Your life's going to really, really change. Whole new identity for Peter. And Peter is the one who would become the closest friend to Jesus. He is the leader of the 12 disciples. And he is the one to whom the keys of the kingdom would be given, which we'll be talking about in another lesson. So don't you just kind of wonder what in the world would have gone through Peter's mind? Just meets him, his brother saying it's the Messiah, and Jesus is giving him a new name. I mean, oh, so much, right? Kind of overwhelming. You can't even imagine what he might have been, been thinking and clearly couldn't have grasped what all of that was going to mean in that moment. The other thing that I found interesting was it, it means rock, right? A rock ledge. And I couldn't help but think about in that first century culture, the use of stones and rocks. Right? They were used for all kinds of things, right? Um, they built all, all the, most of their homes and buildings are, are out of rocks. They would pile up rocks to um, create borders around things. And then I think the most interesting one, as you recall, they would stack rocks, right, to make memorials. And those memorials were usually placed at some place where God had intervened in some special way on behalf of his people such as crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And now Jesus is telling Peter, now you're rock. Jesus saw past that unsteady, somewhat easily unnerved personality of Peter to see the great spiritual leader this young fisherman could become. <laughs> Don't you just love that about the Lord? He just comes in and accepts you just like you are. He works and all for us too, right? But he sees, already sees our potential, just as he saw Peter's potential. And throughout the study of Peter, you think about it, every time that Jesus calls him Peter, rock, right? He's reminding Peter, as it, well as anybody else in the earshot, of the kind of man that Peter was going to become. A rock, right? A significant and strong apostle for Jesus. Now, those who like trivia, <laughs> a little trivia piece here. In the Gospels, he is referred to Simon Peter 54 times, but he's referred to as Cephas, rock, 115 times. I didn't count those, obviously. <laughs> now, let's think about this a little bit. Perhaps most of us, many of us, still have not maybe identified all of our greatest strengths, all of the potential that we have. You know, when we're first introduced to Jesus, we can't really much at all see ourselves as Jesus sees us, right? He, we don't see us as he sees us. Just like he looked deep inside Peter, he, looked, he looks deep inside us, and he knows who we are. One author compared this really well to Michelangelo, whose art form, he says, did not begin when he first picked up the chisel and hammer and went to the rock. And I want to read this short paragraph to you about how he describes what Michelangelo did. Young Michelangelo had to learn how to look at rough-hewn marble and envision what could be created from it. 
Once he had selected what he thought was a suitable piece of marble, he had to live with the stone for a while. He actually did. After having the marble delivered to his studio, he would rise with the dawn each morning and examine it. He had learned from the great masters that the soft dawn light is best for catching a glimpse inside that translucent marble and for seeing the veins of that rock, its flaws, overall being able to see the character that is unique to that one piece of stone. Only after spending time understanding the rock would Michelangelo begin to shape it with a chisel and a hammer. That's what Jesus right, is doing here with Simon, right? He's looking deep inside Simon's soul, seeing the character strengths as well as the flaws that needed to be shaped over time. But above all, he saw deep inside there and he saw the potential. He saw that potential. He is very fine rock. He will make a fine disciple. Same thing that he does when he looks inside us. What we don't see, he sees that great potential. To follow Jesus is to be sent on a lifelong journey that we will clarify and sharpen our identities, right? And our gifts that we're given. He sets us on a path to becoming the name that is our own.